Chapters One and Two of the Right Away. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Right of Way by Gilbert Parker. They had lived and loved, and walked and worked in their own way, and the world went by them. Between them and it, a great gulf was fixed, and they met its every catastrophe with the quid refer of the philosophers. I want to talk with some old lover's ghost who lived before the god of love was born. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Chapter One The Way to the Verdict Not guilty, Your Honor. A hundred atmospheres had seemed pressing down on the fretted people in the crowded courtroom. As the discordant treble of the huge foreman of the jury squeaked over the mass of gaping humanity, which had twitched its skirts, drawn purposeless hands across prickling faces, and kept nervous legs at a gallop, the smothering weights of elastic air lifted suddenly, a great suspiration of relief swept through the place like a breeze, and in a far corner of the gallery a woman laughed outright. The judge looked up reprovingly at the gallery. The clerk of the court angrily called silence towards the offending corner, and seven or eight hundred eyes raced between three centers of interest the judge, the prisoner, and the prisoner's counsel. Perhaps more people looked at the prisoner's counsel than at the prisoner, certainly far more than looked at the judge. Never was a verdict more unexpected. If a poll had been taken of the judgment of the population twenty-four hours before, a great majority would have found believing that there was no escape for the prisoner who was accused of murdering a wealthy timber merchant. The minority would have based their belief that the prisoner had a chance of escape, not on his possible innocence, not on insufficient evidence, but on a curious faith in the prisoner's lawyer. This minority would not have been composed of the friends of the lawyer alone, but of outside spectators who, because Charlie Steele had never lost a criminal case, attached to him a certain incapacity for bad luck, and of very young men who looked upon him as the perfect pattern of the person good to see and hard to understand. During the first two days of the trial the case had gone wholly against the prisoner, who had given his name as Joseph Nadeau. Witnesses had heard him quarreling with the murdered man, and the next day the body of the victim had been found by the roadside. The prisoner was a stranger in the lumber camp where the deed was done, and while there had been morose and lived apart, no one knew him and he refused to tell even his lawyer whence he came, or what his origin, or to bring witnesses from his home to speak for his character. One by one the points had been made against him, with no perceptible effect upon Charlie Steele, who seemed the one cool, undisturbed person in the courtroom. Indifferent as he seemed, seldom speaking to the prisoner, often looking out of the windows to the cool green trees far over the hill, absorbed and unbusinesslike, Yet judge and jury came to see, before the second day was done, that he had let no essential thing pass, that the questions he asked had either a pregnant aptness, opened up new avenues of deliberation, or were touched with mystery, seemed to have a longer reach than the moment or the hour. Before the end of this second day, however, more attention was upon him than upon the prisoner and nine-tenths of the people in the courtroom could have told how many fine linen handkerchiefs he used during the afternoon, how many times he adjusted his monocle to look at the judge meditatively. Probably no man, for eight hours a day, ever exasperated and tried a judge, jury, and public, as did this man of twenty-nine years of age, who had been known at college as Beauty Steel, and who was still so spoken of familiarly, or was called as familiarly, Charlie Steele, by people who had never attempted to be familiar with him. The second day of the trial had ended gloomily for the prisoner. The coil of evidence had drawn so close that extrication seemed impossible. That the evidence was circumstantial, that no sign of the crime was upon the prisoner, that he was found sleeping quietly in his bed when he was arrested, that he had not been seen to commit the deed, did not weigh in the minds of the general public. The man's guilt was freely believed. Not even the few 
who clung to the opinion that Charlie Steele would yet get him off, thought that he was innocent. There seemed no flaw in the evidence, once granted its circumstantiality. During the last two hours of the sitting the prisoner had looked at his counsel in despair, for he seemed perfunctorily conducting the case, was occupied in sketching upon the blotting pad before him, looking out of the window, or turning his head occasionally towards a corner where sat a half-dozen well-dressed ladies, and more particularly towards one lady who watched him in a puzzled way, more than once with a look of disappointment. Only at the very close of the sitting did he appear to rouse himself. Then, for a brief ten minutes, he cross-examined a friend of the murdered merchant in a fashion which startled the courtroom, for he suddenly brought out the fact that the dead man had once struck a woman in the face in the open street. This fact, sharply stated by the prisoner's counsel, with no explanation and no comment, seemed uselessly intrusive and malicious. His ironical smile merely irritated all concerned. The thin, clean-shaven face of the prisoner grew more pinched and downcast, and he turned almost pleadingly towards the judge. The judge pulled his long side-whiskers nervously and looked over his glasses in severe annoyance, then hastily adjourned the sitting and left the bench, while the prisoner saw with dismay his lawyer leave the courtroom with not even a glance towards him. On the morning of the third day Charlie Steele's face for the first time wore an expression which, by a stretch of the imagination, might be called anxious. He also took out his monocle frequently, rubbed it with his handkerchief, and screwed it in again, staring straight before him much of the time. But twice he spoke to the prisoner in a low voice, and was hurriedly answered in French as crude as his own was perfect. When he spoke, which was at rare intervals, his voice was without feeling, concise, insistent, unappealing. It was as though the business before him was wholly alien to him, as though he were held there against his will, but would go on with his task bitterly to the bitter end. The court adjourned for an hour at noon. During this time Charlie refused to see anyone, but sat alone in his office with a few biscuits and an ominous bottle before him till the time came for him to go back to the courthouse. Arrived there he entered by a side door, and was not seen until the court opened once more. For two hours and a half the Crown Attorney mercilessly made out his case against the prisoner. When he sat down people glanced meaningly at each other, as though the last word had been said, then looked at the prisoner as at one already condemned. Yet Charlie Steele was to reply. He was not now the same man that had conducted the case during the past two and a half days. Some great change had passed over him. There was no longer abstraction, indifference, or apparent boredom or disdain or distant stare. He was human, intimate and eager, yet concentrated and impelling. He was quietly, unnoticeably, drunk. He assured the prisoner with a glance of the eye, with a word scarce above a whisper, as he slowly rose to make his speech for the defense. His first words caused a new feeling in the courtroom. He was a new presence. The personality had a changed significance. At first the public, the jury, and the judge were curiously attracted, surprised into a fresh interest. The voice had an insinuating quality, but it also had a measured force, a subterranean insistence, a winning tactfulness. With all, a logical simplicity governed his argument. The flaneur, the pursier, if such he was, no longer appeared. He came close to the jurymen, leaned his hands upon the back of a chair, as it were, shut out the public, even the judge, from his circle of interest, and talked in a conversational tone. An air of confidence passed from him to the amazed yet easily captivated jury. The distance between them, so gapping during the last two days, suddenly closed up. The tension of the past estrangement, relaxing all at once, surprised the jury into an almost eager friendliness, as on a long voyage a sensitive traveler finds in some exciting accident a natural introduction to an exclusive fellow-passenger whom he discovers, as human as he had thought him, offensively distant. Charlie began by congratulating the Crown Attorney on his statement of the case. He called it masterly. 
He said that in its presentations it was irrefutable, as a precise of evidence purely circumstantial it was, useful and interesting. But speech-making aside, and ability, and rhetoric aside, and even personal conviction aside, the case should stand or fall by its total, not its comparative soundness. Since the evidence was purely circumstantial, there must be no flaw in its cable of assumption. It must be logically inviolate within itself. Starting with assumption only, there must be no string possibilities, no loose ends of certainty, no invading alternatives. Was this so in the case of the man before them? They were faced by a curious situation. So far as the trial was concerned, the prisoner himself was the only person who could tell them who he was, what was his past, and, if he committed the crime, what was the motive of it, out of what spirit of revenge or hatred the dead man had been sent to his account. Probably in the whole history of crime there never was a more peculiar case. Even himself the prisoner's counsel was dealing with one whose life was hid from him previous to the day the murdered man was discovered by the roadside. The prisoner had not sought to prove an alibi. He had done no more than formally plead not guilty. There was no material for defense save that offered by the prosecution. He had undertaken the defense of the prisoner because it was his duty as a lawyer to see that the law justified itself, that it satisfied every demand of proof to the last atom of certainty, that it met the final possibility of doubt with evidence perfect and inviolate if circumstantial an uncontradictory if eye-witness, if tell-tale incident were to furnish basis of proof. Judge, jury, and public riveted their eyes upon Charlie Steele. He had now drawn a little farther away from the jury box. His eye took in the judge as well. Once or twice he turned, as if appealing and confidently, to the people in the room. It was terribly hot. The air was sickeningly close. Everyone seemed depressed everyone save a lady sitting not a score of feet from where the counsel for the prisoner stood. This lady's face was not one that could flush easily. It belonged to a temperament as even as her person was symmetrically beautiful. As Charlie talked her eyes were fixed steadily, wonderingly upon him. There was a question in her gaze which never in the course of the speech was quite absorbed by the admiration, the intense admiration, she was feeling for him. Once, as he turned, with a concentrated earnestness in her direction, his eyes met hers. The message he flashed her was subconscious, for his mind never wavered an instant from the cause in hand, but it said to her, When this is over, Kathleen, I will come to you. For another quarter of an hour he exposed the fallacy of purely circumstantial evidence. He raised in the minds of his hearers the painful responsibility of the law the awful tyranny of miscarriage of justice. He condemned prejudice against a prisoner because that prisoner demanded that the law should prove him guilty, instead of his proving himself innocent. If a man chose to stand to that, to sternly assume this perilous position, the law had no right to take advantage of it. He turned towards the prisoner and traced his possible history. As the sensitive, intelligent son of godly Catholic parents, from some remote parish in French Canada, he drew an imaginary picture of the home from which he might have come, and of the parents and brothers and sisters who would have lived weeks of torture knowing that their son and brother was being tried for his life. It might at first glance seem quixotic, eccentric, but was it unnatural that the prisoner should choose silence as to his origin and home rather than have his family and friends face the undoubted peril lying before him? Besides, though his past life might have been wholly blameless, it would not be evidence in his favor. It might indeed, if it had not been blameless, provide some element of unjust suspicion against him, furnish some fancied motive. The prisoner had chosen his path, and events had so far justified him. It must be clear to the minds of judge and jury that there were fatally weak places in the circumstantial evidence offered for the conviction of this man. There was the fact that no sign of the crime, no drop of blood, no weapon was found about him or near him, and that he was peacefully sleeping at the moment the constable arrested him. There was also the fact that no motive for the crime had been shown. 
it was not enough that he and the dead man had been heard quarreling. Was there any certainty that it was a quarrel, since no word or sentence of the conversation had been brought into court? Men with quick tempers might quarrel over trivial things, but exasperation did not always end in bodily injury and the taking of life. Imprecations were not so uncommon that they could be taken as evidence of willful murder. The prisoner refused to say what that troubled conversation was about, but who could question his right to take the risk of his silence being misunderstood? The judge was alternately taking notes and looking fixedly at the prisoner. The jury were in various attitudes of strained attention. The public sat open-mouthed, and up in the gallery a woman with white face and clenched hands listened moveless and staring. Charlie Steele was holding captive the emotions and the judgments of his hearers. All antipathy had gone. There was a strange eager intimacy between the jurymen and himself. People no longer looked with distant dislike at the prisoner, but began to see innocence in his grim silence, disdain only in his surly defiance. But Charlie Steele had preserved his great stroke for the psychological moment. He suddenly launched upon them the fact, brought out in evidence, that the dead man had struck a woman in the face a year ago, also that he had kept a factory girl in affluence for two years. Here was motive for murder, if motive were to govern them, far greater than might be suggested by excited conversation which listeners who could not hear a word construed into a quarrel, listeners who bore the prisoner at the bar ill-willed because he shunned them while in the lumber camp. If the prisoner was to be hanged for motive untraceable, why should not these two women be hanged for motive traceable? Here was his chance. He appeared to impeach subtly every intelligence in the room for having had any preconviction about the prisoner's guilt. He compelled the jury to feel that they, with him, had made the discovery of the unsound character of the evidence. The man might be guilty, but their personal guilt, the guilt of the law, would be far greater if they condemned the man on violable evidence. With a last simple appeal, his hands resting on the railing before the seat where the jury sat, his voice low and conversational again, his eyes running down the line of the faces of men who had his client's life in their hands, he said, It is not a life only that is at stake. It is not revenge for a life snatched from the busy world by a brutal hand that we should heed today, but the awful responsibility of that thing we call the state, which, having the power of life and death, without gainsay or hindrance, should prove to the last inch of necessity its right to take a human life. And the right and the reason should bring conviction to every honest human mind. That is all I have to say. The Crown Attorney made a perfunctory reply. The judge's charge was brief and, if anything, a little in favor of the prisoner. Very little, a casuous little, and the jury filed out of the room. They were gone but ten minutes. When they returned the verdict was given. Not guilty, Your Honor. Then it was that a woman laughed in the gallery. Then a whispering voice said across the railing which separated the public from the lawyers, Charlie, Charlie! Though Charlie turned and looked at the lady who spoke, he made no response. A few minutes later, outside the court, as he walked quickly away, again inscrutable and debonair, the prisoner, Joseph Nadeau, touched him on the arm and said, Monsieur, monsieur, you have saved my life. I thank you, monsieur. Charlie Steele drew his arm away with disgust. Get out of my sight. You're guilty as hell, he said. End of chapter one. Chapter two. What came of the trial? When this is over, Kathleen, I will come to you. So Charlie Steele's eyes had said to a lady in the courtroom on that last day of the great trial. The lady had left the courtroom dazed and exalted. She, with hundreds of others, had had a revelation of Charlie Steele, had had also the great emotional experience of seeing a crowd make the vault fast with their convictions, looking at a prisoner one moment with eyes of loathing and anticipating his gruesome end, the next moment seeing him as the possible martyr to the machinery of law. She, whose heart was used to beat so evenly, had felt it leap and swell with excitement, awaiting the moment when the jury filed back into the courtroom. Then it stood still, 
as a wave might hang for an instant at its crest ere it swept down to beat upon the shore. With her, as with most present, the deepest feeling in the agitated suspense was not so much that the prisoner should go free as that the prisoner's counsel should win his case. It was as if Charlie Steele were on trial instead of the prisoner. He was the imminent figure. It was his fate that was in the balance. Such was the antic irony of suggestion. And the truth was that the fates of both prisoner and counsel had been weighed in the balance that sweltering August day. The prisoner was forgotten almost as soon as he had left the courtroom a free man, but wherever men and women met in Montreal that day one name was on the lips of all, Charlie Steele. In his speech he had done two things. He had thrown down every barrier of reserve, or so it seemed, and had become human and intimate. I could not have believed it of him, was the remark on every lip. Of his ability there never had been a moment's doubt, but it had ever been an uncomfortable ability. It had tortured foes and made friends anxious. No one had ever seen him show feeling. If it was a mask he had worn it with a curious consistency. It had been with him as a child, at school, at college, and he had brought it back again to the town where he was born. It had effectually prevented his being popular, but it had made him, with his foppishness and his originality, an object of perpetual interest. Few men had ventured to cross swords with him. He left his fellow citizens very much alone. He was uniformly, if distantly, courteous, and he was respected in his own profession for his uncommon powers and for an utter indifference as to whether he had cases in court or not. Coming from the judge's chambers after the trial he went to his office, receiving as he passed congratulations more effusively offered than, as people presently found, his manner warranted, for he was again the formal, masked Charlie Steele, looking calmly through the interrogative eyeglass. By the time he reached his office greetings became more subdued. His prestige had increased immensely in a few short hours, but he had no more friends than before old relations were soon re-established. The town was proud of his ability as it had always been, irritated by his manner as it had always been, more prophetic of his future than it had ever been, and unconsciously grateful for the fact that he had given them a sensation which would outlast the summer. All these things concerned him little. Once the business of the courtroom was over, a thought which had quietly lain in waiting behind the strenuous occupations of his brain leaped forward to exclude all others. As he entered his office he was thinking of that girl's face in the courtroom, with its flush of added beauty which he and his speech had brought there. "'What a perfect loveliness!' he said to himself as he bathed his face and hands and prepared to go into the street again. She needed just such a flush to make her supreme Kathleen." He stood looking out into the square, out into the green of the trees where the birds twittered, faultless in form and feature. She was so as a child, she is so as a woman. He lighted a cigarette and blew away little clouds of smoke. I will do it. I will marry her. She will have me. I saw it in her eye. Faring doesn't matter. Her uncle will never consent to that, and she doesn't care enough for him. She cares, but she doesn't care enough. I will do it." He turned towards a cupboard into which he had put a certain bottle before he went to the courtroom two hours before. He put the key in the lock and then stopped. "'No, I think not,' he said. "'What I say to her shall not be said forensically. What a discovery I've made! I was dull, blank, all iron and ice, the judge, the jury, the public, even Kathleen against me. And then that bottle in there, and I saw things like crystal. I had a glow in my brain, I had a tingle in my fingers, and I had success and his face clouded. He was guilty as hell, he added almost bitterly as he put the key of the cupboard into his pocket again. There was a knock at the door and a youth of nineteen entered. Hello, he said, I say, sir, but that speech of yours struck us all where we couldn't say no. Even Kathleen got in a glow over it. Perhaps Captain Fairing didn't, for he's just left her in a huff, and she's looking. You remember those lines in the school book? A red spot burned upon her cheek, streamed her red tresses down. He laughed gaily. 
I've come to ask you up to tea,' he added. "'The Unclekins is there.' When I told him that Kathleen had sent Faring away with a flea in his ear, he nearly fell off his chair. He lent me twenty dollars on the spot. Are you coming our way? he continued, suddenly trying to imitate Charlie's manner. Charlie nodded, and they left the office together and moved away under a long avenue of maples, to where, in the shade of a high hill, was the house of the uncle of Kathleen Wantage, with whom she and her brother Billy lived. They walked in silence for some time, and at last Billy said apropos of nothing. Faring hasn't the red scent. "'You have a perambulating mind, Billy,' said Charlie, and bowed to a young clergyman approaching them from the opposite direction. "'What does that mean?' remarked Billy, and said hello to the young clergyman, and did not wait for Charlie's answer. The Reverend John Brown was by no means a conventional person. He was smoking a cigarette, and two dogs followed at his heels. He was certainly not a fogey. He had more than a little admiration for Charlie Steele, but found it difficult to preach when Charlie was in the congregation. He was always aware of a subterranean and half-pitying criticism going on in the barrister's mind. John Brown knew that he could never match his intelligence against Charlie's in spite of the theological course at Durham, so he undertook to scotch the snake by kindness. He thought that he might be able to do this because Charlie who was known to be frankly agnostical, came to his church more or less regularly. The Reverend John Brown was not indifferent to what men thought of him. He had a reputation for being independent, but his chief independence consisted in dressing a little like a layman, posing as the athletic parson of the new school, consenting with ministers of the dissenting denominations when it was sufficiently effective, and being a good fellow with men easily bored by church and churchmen. He preached theatrical sermons to societies and benevolent associations. He wanted to be thought well of on all hands, and he was shrewd enough to know that if he trimmed between ritualism on one hand and evangelicalism on the other, he was on a safe road. He might perforate old dogmatical prejudices with a good deal of freedom so long as he did not begin bringing millinery into the service of the church. He invested his own personal habits with the millinery. He looked a picturesque figure with his blond moustache, a little silk-lined brown cloak thrown carelessly over his shoulder, a gold-headed cane, and a brisk jacket half ecclesiastical, half military. He had interested Charlie Steele, also he had amused him, and sometimes he had surprised him into a sort of admiration, for Brown had a temperament capable of little inspirations, such a literary inspiration as might come to a second-rate actor and Charlie never belittled any man's ability, but seized upon every sign of knowledge with the appreciation of the epicure. John Brown raised his hat to Charlie, then held out a hand. "'Masterly, masterly,' he said. "'Permit my congratulations. It was the one thing to do. You couldn't have saved him by making him an object of pity, by appealing to our sympathies.' "'What do you take to be the secret, then?' asked Charlie, with a look half abstracted, half quizzical. Terror terror, sheer terror, you startled the conscience, you made defects in the circumstantial evidence, the imminent problems of our own salvations. You put us all on trial. We were under the lash of fear. If we parsons could only do that from the pulpit. We will discuss that on our shooting trip next week. Duck shooting gives plenty of time for theological asides. You are coming, eh? John Brown scarcely noticed the sarcasm. He was so delighted at the suggestion that he was to be included in the annual duck shoot of the seven, as the little yearly party of Charlie and his friends the late Aubergine was called. He had angled for this invitation for two years. I must not keep you, Charlie said, and dismissed him with a bow. The sheep will stray, and the shepherd must use his crook. Brown smiled at the badinage, and went on his way rejoicing in the fact that he was to share the amusements of the seven at Lake Aubergine, the lake of the mad apple. To get hold of these seven men of repute and position, to be admitted into this good presence, he had a pious exultation. But whether it was because he might gather into the fold erratic and agnostical sheep like Charlie Steele, or because it pleased his social ambitions, he had occasion to answer in the future. He gaily prepared to go to the Lake of the Mad Apple, where he was fated to eat of the Tree of Knowledge. Charlie Steele and Billy Wantage walked on slowly to the house under the hill. 
"'He's the right sort,' said Billy. "'He's a sport. I can stand that kind. Did you ever hear him sing? No? Well, he can sing a comic song fit to make you die. I can sing a bit myself, but to hear him sing the man who couldn't get warm is a show in itself. He can play the banjo, too, and the guitar, but he's best on the banjo. It's worth a dollar to listen to his Evaham. That's Ephraim, you know. Ephraham come home, and I found why in de honeysuckle patch. He preaches, too, said Charlie dryly. They had reached the door of the house under the hill, and Billy had no time for further remark. He ran into the drawing-room, announcing Charlie with the words, I say, Kathleen, I brought the man that made the judge sit up. Billy suddenly stopped, however, for there sat the judge who had tried the case, calmly munching a piece of toast. The judge did not allow himself the luxury of embarrassment, but bowed to Charlie with a smile, which he presently turned on Kathleen, who came as near being disconcerted as she had ever been in her life. Kathleen had passed through a good deal to look so unflurried. She had been on trial in the courtroom, as well as the prisoner. Important things had been at stake with her. She and Charlie Steele had known each other since they were children. To her, even in childhood, he had been a dominant figure. He had judicially and admiringly told her she was beautiful when he was twelve and she five. But he had said it without any of those glances which usually accompany the same sentiments in the mouths of other lads. He had never made boy love to her, and she had thrilled at the praise of less splendid people than Charlie Steele. He had always piqued her. He was so superior to the ordinary enchantments of youth, beauty, and fine linen. As he came and went, growing older and more characteristic, more and more beauty steel, accompanied by legends of wild deeds and days at college, by tales of his fopperies and the fashions he had sent, she herself had grown, as he had termed it, more decorative. He had told her so, not in the least patronizingly, but as a simple fact in which no sentiment lurked. He thought her the most beautiful thing he had ever seen, but he had never regarded her save as a creation for the perfect pleasure of the eye. He thought her the concrete glory of sensuous purity, no more capable of sentiment than himself. He had said again and again, as he grew older and left college and began the business of life after two years in Europe, that sentiment would spoil her, would scatter the charm of her perfect beauty. It would vitalize her too much and her nature would lose its proportion. She would be decentralized. She had been piqued at his indifference to sentiment. She could not easily be content without worship, though she felt none. This pique had grown until Captain Tom Faring crossed her path. Faring was the antithesis of Charlie Steele. Handsome, poor, enthusiastic, and none too able, he was simple and straightforward, and might be depended on till the end of the chapter and the end of it was that in so far as she had ever felt real sentiment for anybody, she felt it for Tom Faring of the Royal Fusiliers. It was not love she felt in the old, in the big, in the noble sense, but it had behind it selection and instinct and natural gravitation. Faring declared his love. She would give him no answer, for as soon as she was presented with the issue, the destiny, she began to look round her anxiously. The first person to fill the perspective was Charlie Steele. As her mind dwelt on him, her uncle gave forth his judgment that she should never have a penny if she married Tom Ferry. This only irritated her. It did not influence her. But there was Charlie. He was a figure, was already noted in his profession because of a few masterly successes in criminal cases, and if he was not popular he was distinguished and the world would talk about him to the end. He was handsome, and he was well-to-do, he had a big unoccupied house on the hill among the maples. How many people had said, what a couple they would make, Charlie Steele and Kathleen Wantage. So as Faring presented an issue to her, she concentrated her thoughts as she had never done before on the man whom the world set apart for her in a way the world has. As she looked and looked, Charlie began to look also. He had not been enamored of the sordid things of the world. He had been merely curious. He thought vice was ugly. He had imagination and a sense of form. Kathleen was beautiful. 
sentiment had, so he thought, never seriously disturbed her. He did not think it ever would. It had not affected him. He did not understand it. He had been born non intime. He had had acquaintances, but never friendships, and never loves or love. But he had a fine sense of the fitting and the proportionate, and he worshipped beauty in so far as he could worship anything. The homage was cerebral, intellectual, temperamental, not of the heart. As he looked out upon the world half pityingly, half ironically, he was struck with wonder at the disproportion which was engendered by having heart, as it was called. He did not find it necessary. Now that he had begun to think of marriage, who was so suitable as Kathleen? He knew of Fairing's adoration, but he took it as a matter of course that she had nothing to give of the same sort in return. Her beauty was still serene and unimpaired. He would not spoil it by the tortures of emotion. He would try to make Kathleen's heart beat in harmony with his own. It should not thunder out of time. He had made up his mind that he would marry her. For Kathleen, with the great trial, the beginning of the end had come. Charlie's power over her was subtle, finely sensuous, and in deciding there were no mere heart impulses working for Charlie. Instinct and impulse were working in another direction. She had not committed her mind to either man, though her heart, to a point, was committed to Faring. On the day of the trial, however, she fell wholly under that influence which had swayed judge, jury, and public. To her the verdict of the jury was not in favor of the prisoner at the bar. She did not think of him. It was in favor of Charlie Steele. And so, indifferent as to who heard, over the heads of the people in front of her, to the accused counsel inside the railings, she had called softly, Charlie, Charlie. Now, in the house under the hill, they were face to face, and the end was at hand, the end of something and the beginning of something. There was a few moments of casual conversation in which Billy talked as much as anybody, and then Kathleen said, "'What do you suppose was the man's motive for committing the murder?' Charlie looked at Kathleen steadily, curiously, through his monocle. It was a singular compliment she paid him. Her remark took no heed of the verdict of the jury. She turned inquiringly towards the judge, who, though slightly shocked by the question, recovered himself quickly. "'What do you think it was, sir?' Charlie asked quietly. "'A woman, in revenge, perhaps,' answered the judge, with a matter-of-course air. A few moments afterwards the judge was carried off by Kathleen's uncle to see some rare old books. Billy, his work being done, vanished, and Kathleen and Charlie were left alone. "'You did not answer me in the courtroom,' Kathleen said. "'I called to you.' "'I wanted to hear you say them here,' he rejoined. "'Say what?' she asked, a little puzzled by the tone of his voice. "'Your congratulations,' he answered. She held out a hand to him. "'I offer them now. It was wonderful. You were inspired. I did not think you could ever let yourself go.' He held her hand firmly. "'I promise not to do it again,' he said whimsically. "'Why not?' "'Have I not your congratulations?' His hand drew her slightly towards him. She rose to her feet. "'That is no reason,' she answered, confused, yet feeling that there was a double meaning in his words. "'I could not allow you to be so vain,' he said. "'We must be companionable. Henceforth I shall congratulate myself, Kathleen.' There was no mistaking now. "'Oh, what is it you are going to say to me?' she asked, yet not disengaging her hand. "'I said it all in the courtroom,' he rejoined, and you heard. "'You want me to marry you, Charlie?' she asked frankly. "'If you think there is no just impediment,' he answered with a smile. She drew her hand away, and for a moment there was a struggle in her mind, or heart. He knew of what she was thinking, and he did not consider it of serious consequence. Romance was a trivial thing, and women were prone to become absorbed in trivialities. When the woman had no brains she might break her life upon a trifle. But Kathleen had an even mind, a serene temperament, her nerves were daily cooled in the bath of nature's perfect health. She had never had an hour's illness in her life. There is no just or unjust impediment, Kathleen, he added presently, and took her hand again. She looked him in the eyes clearly. You really think so? she asked. I know so, he answered. 
we shall be two perfect panels in one picture of life. End of chapter two. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.